Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know, if you've seen our broadcast before, that we are studying the Sabbath School lessons, the daily Sabbath School lessons that we hope that you've studied and prepare for each week, as presented by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, this particular series is for the months of January, February, and March of 2014. And this is lesson number seven in that series for February 15 of 2014. It's entitled, Jesus and the Social Outcasts, and talks about some very interesting and pretty well-known stories uh, with a lot of lessons, I think, for us. So I hope you have your Bible handy. We'll be looking at that. And I would like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, it's with a great deal of pride that we look at your example to think that you led in such marvelous ways, but perhaps a little bit of embarrassment that we haven't done so well at following. Help us to see in this lesson how to relate to people who belong to perhaps a different social class than we do, or even to people who belong to our own social class. Help us to see in these stories something more of your character and your government and how it operates is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in the materials that we use to study these lessons, they're available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And there's a lot of material there. Uh, downloads, audio, video, handouts, just about anything you might want to study this lesson. So Jesus and the social outcasts. It seems if you read the Gospels, Jesus spent a lot of time dealing with what some people sort of sneeringly regard as the bottom dwellers. The down and outs, the social outcasts, the people who don't have much money. We will focus on several of those stories, people in that category. The woman taken in adultery found in John 8. The demon-possessed man or men is described in Mark 5, Matthew 8, and Luke 8. The Samaritan woman at the well of Sychar in John 4 and Matthew's feast as described in Matthew 9, Mark 2, and Luke 15. So you can see that there's quite a bit of coverage of these stories in the Gospels. And so my first question to all of you here is, why do you suppose the Gospel writers felt that it was worthwhile to really focus on these Stories about the social outcasts, the down and outers. Well, <clears throat> most of the time they were the ones that came for help, so mm -hmm. that uh, it made it easy to contact these people. Okay. <clears throat> the writers described what Jesus did much of the time, and most of the time, or a large part of his time, seemingly most, he spent with the social outcasts. Okay. Now, l let's be honest. There are no societies that don't have their hierarchies. And for whatever reason, it usually is true that at the top of the pyramid that we talk about, there are the people with lots of education, the people who have a lot of money. And somewhere in the middle, there's a large group of people who maybe they own their own businesses or they, ha they have a good education and they have a, 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 a well-paying job. And then somewhere at the bottom, there's what, what we call them. There's the prostitutes. They're the substance abusers. They're the criminals. They're the homeless. And in Jesus' day, there were several categories that maybe we wouldn't consider to be bottom dwellers in our day. I hope not. There were the lepers. Maybe so. The tax collectors. Hmm. Even doctors. Now, why would a doctor be considered a bottom dweller? They dealt with sickness. Unclean. They, unclean. they dealt with uncleanness, they dealt with sickness, even death, on a regular basis. And every time, if you remember the rules from Leviticus and Numbers and Exodus, every time you deal with something, a sickness or a, or, or, or a death, you're unclean, right? So doctors even belong in that category. They're not understanding exactly much about modern medicine as we do today. So, Let's look at our first story. Um, look at Matthew 21. Here's just a kind of an introduction. Matthew 21, 
starting with verse 28 to 32. It, it'll just give us a, a, a framework for which to think of maybe these other stories. Now, what do you think? Jesus tells this story. There was once a man who had two sons. He went to the older one and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. I don't want to, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. Yes, sir, he answered. But he did not go. Which one of the two did what his father wanted? The older one, they answered. So Jesus said to them, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes, I'm not quite sure why he chose to mention those two groups, are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. And he's talking to the Jewish leaders. For John the Baptist came to you showing you the right path to take, and you would not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. Even when you saw this, you did not later change your minds and believe him. So, how were the tax collectors and the prostitutes ahead of the, so, the social elite and the, and the spiritual leaders of, of Judea? They believed him. They, took they the, believed him. Took the training. They, so, what was it that they believed? Or that they didn't, the prostitutes and the tax collectors <laughs> believed that the the, the, the Sadducees and the scribes and the Pharisees didn't believe. Well, Jesus did a lot of teaching with, with mm -hmm. telling of parables, and apparently they were attracted to it and had some impact on their lives, you would assume. Okay. The Pharisees feel like they already knew everything. Okay. That the Sadducees and scribes and Pharisees were scoundrels. Yeah. Okay, so that qualifies them as... Well, you ask, <laughs> what did they believe? That the okay. <laughs> well, l l I mean, let's be, let's be honest. Go ahead, Gordon. So the Pharisees and Sadducees were the rich people, more or less. Mm -hmm. So they knew, they had proof that they were blessed by God. Mm -hmm. So they must be good people. Yes, of course. And that's, there's lots of support for that in the Old Testament. Yes. There's support for other things, too. But so if you believe something that's wrong, but you think you have support for it, is it easy to change your mind? No, very difficult. So these people were operating under what we call a wrong paradigm. They had a wrong bunch of beliefs. And it turns out that it's very often more difficult to give up your wrong ideas than it is to adopt new ones. Well, and much of what they had sought to do in order to accomplish the status that they had accomplished was the avoidance of mm -hmm. the lifestyles and the attitudes of, mm -hmm. of uh, the lower classes. So, why, why? I mean, as Gordon pointed out, <coughs> if, you have, if you're rich, that's proof that God has blessed you, therefore you must be doing what's right. So you, it's easy to stand on the street of Loma Linda and tell who the righteous people are. They're the ones who drop, drive by in Mercedes, right? Tax collectors recognized John for what he was, what he was trying to do. The Pharisees and Sadducees were hiding behind a solid wall of hypocrisy. Yes. And there's nothing gets seen through quicker than that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how do you explain this other verse that matches the Matthew one? This was found in Luke in the 15th chapter. And we don't have time to go through the whole series, but go through verses 1 to 10. And you come to verse 7 and verse 10, it says... In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 respectable people who do not need to repent. Why would Jesus say a thing like that? That's just hyperbole. It, it's, it's an exaggeration to make a point. Okay. He's trying to get, get their attention, and so he has to give a, an exaggerated... Okay, but what was he trying to say? I'm get sure. them to listen. Huh? Well... What, but why would he, oh, Ken's well, question is, why would he say that? Because he's trying to get the uh, people to listen and take instructions so that they will repent. So the, basically what he seems to be implying is these 99 respectable people, with quotation marks, don't think they need to change. They're quite happy how they are. And, and the one person who repents, what does repent mean? The Greek word is metanoia, means to change your mind. They are willing to learn. They, they saw Jesus, they saw John the Baptist, and they said, 
These people have something we need to learn. We need to pay attention. I think the real bottom line there is some people are willing to learn and others people aren't. And the people who aren't willing to learn, Jesus had a real hard time with them. So you have to be poor and a downcast and then you can learn. Well, uh, no, no, because we're going to study some future lessons in this series that said some of the rich people did learn. But the percentage of rich people who learned was quite less, quite a bit lower than the percentage of poor people. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to get you to think about why that might be. Well, I, I was trying to come up with a conclusion here, and that's the mm -hmm. only thing I could come up with. I see. So far. Does anybody have an idea? Well... For some reason, when you're in trouble, it's easier to look beyond yourself mm -hmm. for, for relief. And when you aren't in trouble, if you have all of your needs met, at least as far as you think temporally anyway, mm -hmm. then you're, you're not inclined to look around for any kind of help. So yeah. When you're hungry, when you're poor, when you are hurting, um, when you don't have the resources to resolve those problems, then you're more inclined to look to something beyond yourself. <coughs> okay. The, the RSV says, uh, uh, in, in verse 7 there, it says, over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So it's assumed that the, oh. uh, this, the statement in the RSV that they're righteous, well, if they're righteous, they're already enjoying the benefits of, of living their right life, and so they should not... You wouldn't think that they'd be jealous yeah. of, of, uh, of the one now who's turn, turned his life around. That's why I would read that yeah. sta passage. So, and, and so this is the question. There's two ways to read that. One way is the way you just read it. The other way is to, to read it people who think they're righteous and don't think they need to change. Right. right. So you've got those two options. Which is probably the one that Jesus was driving at, the latter there. Well, since he's speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees, there's a pretty good chance that that might be right. Well, in Jesus' day, let's just see if we can set a little background. In Jesus' day, the socially elite surely included the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. What do we know about the scribes? Of course, now you're talking about the, the Jewish culture right yes. now. Mm -hmm. That's right. But of course, down the road's Herod, and then mm -hmm. you've got the cent centurions in charge of other centurions. and. Yeah. So there's, there's elites in those types of things, yes. too. We're talking about the Jews here now, <clears throat> for right now. What do we know about scribes? They're definitely educated, aren't they? Okay, these are people very well educated. The common language in those days was Aramaic, which is related to Hebrew, but enough difference like between Spanish and Portuguese, so it's not easy to just cross over. The, the scribes were the ones who, who, who read fluently the Hebrew from the Old Testament. They were regarded as the people who'd come to church and give the final word on the understanding of the scriptures. These were people, everybody looked up to them. What do we this know? Is, this is not priests, though. No, yeah. not priests, no. I have a text from uh, Jeremiah uh, 8, mm -hmm. verse 8. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? But behold, the false pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty potent right there. Yeah, exactly. Well, among the millions of Jews in Palestine and scattered throughout the Mediterranean world of those days, there were only about, according to Josephus in his Antiquities, about 6,000 Pharisees. So this is a pretty elite group. The number of Sadducees, we don't have that number, but it was much smaller. And what do we know about the Sadducees? They were the ones who basically hovered around the temple and controlled the temple and the marketplace that went on in the temple and all the, the financial dealings right there and connected with the, with the temple. So they were the ones who were the high priests and so forth. They were a smaller group, but a very elite group. They're pretty tight with probably with the Roman powers. Yeah, yeah. They, for a while anyway, they, someone in that group of Sadducees would literally each year buy permission to be the high priest. They had to buy it from the Roman authority. So, I mean, imagine what the high priest was supposed to be from the days of Aaron, and now they're buying the privilege of being high priest. And how, do they, how could they afford it? Well, they ran that marketplace in the... That's why it the, says... In the Caiaphas, of the temple. 
Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, mm -hmm. says yeah. if the word gets out about Jesus, the whole world's going to fo follow after him. And he wasn't saying praise the Lord. <laughs> no, he wasn't. He was, he was not. They're ec economically what, at risk. What is it that they would do that um, that was different that would put them in the more money? Well, th that there's an easy answer to that. Uh, if you read in in the commentaries and so forth, you discover that uh, you remember it said there were money changers mm -hmm. inside. Well, there was two things that happened. If you wanted to, if you wanted to buy anything inside the temple, you wanted to bring anything, any kind of an animal into the temple to sacrifice it, you had to buy it with the temple shekel, which means that they could set whatever exchange rate they wanted. That's number one. And then secondly, in general, uh, a, a lamb that you could buy for, for maybe five or ten shekels right outside the gate, would be fifty shekels inside. Now, theoretically, you could bring your lamb from home. Theoretically, you? but they would inspect them and say, yes. "Oh, this is defective." Yeah, they would. And so it's not good enough to sacrifice in the temple. Right. But, but I think my question was, how come the, the Pharisees didn't get in on the action? Well, the the Pharisees and the Sadducees had a kind of a unwritten agreement. The Pharisees, I mean, the Sadducees, they had they were the ruling family. And they were the they they controlled things through the high priest and so forth and and the political leader at that point in time, and they had strange beliefs as well, and the Pharisees were were a larger number, but they didn't have the financial strength that the Sadducees did, and so there was a son, sort of an uneven truce between Pharisees and Sadducees because it was only Pharisees and Sadducees that could be members of the Sanhedrin. So. The, they, you know, the Sadducees said, well, you know, we'll let you be a part of our temple organization, the Sanhedrin, run the country, so long as you let us control the high priest, let us control the temple, let us, and, and so it was a... Was it kind of a, a political group? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um... Mutual back scratching. Yeah. Put it Mutual. in the vernacular. Uh, the, they didn't... Well, they, they'd get they'd they'd kind of fight each other uh, over theology, didn't Sometimes, they? Very often, yes. And um, so, so, let's let's just think now. Who do you know by name that was a Sadducee? Joseph of Arimathea. Nic Nicodemus. No, no, a Sadducee. Oh, oh Sadducee. 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 Yeah. The high priest. The high priest, whose name was? There were two that we know. Caiaphas and Annas, his father-in-law. Okay, those, are, as far as I know, the only two Sadducees that we know their names. Now, they're, they're probably if we look in some of the other documents, but from the New Testament, those are the only ones we know. What Pharisees do we know by name? That's the Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, and Simon the former leper. Simon, Simon the former leper, probably. who was an yeah. uncle to. Lazarus. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, which means a good chance that they probably belonged, at least originally belonged to a Pharisee family. What about Paul? Well, Paul was, yeah. Saul and Paul. The one who became the Apostle Paul, yeah. He wasn't in the Gospels, obviously, but later, yes. Yeah. Okay, very good. Now, could Mary and Martha technically be, being women, could they be Pharisees? Or I was just it said just they probably a family? Came from a Pharisee family. Okay. Yeah. Well, since we're focusing on the social elite now, well, I mean, social outcasts. Now, let's leave the elite behind. How do you suppose? Now, Jesus was called a what? Among the Jews? Rabbi. A rabbi, rabbi. a teacher. teacher, a leader. And you had to be a, that was a very elite group of people that were recognized as rabbis, who were recognized, they, were, they had permission to stand up and preach, and they were, you know, the government left them alone because they were supposed to be the wise men. Uh, how, do you, Jesus, how do you suppose Jesus attained that status? Not working well, his way up the ranks, that's for sure. Not with money. No, and not with money, for sure. Well, don't you think that if a person brought people together and started teaching them, that just by default he's going to become a rabbi? I think that's probably what happened in the case of Jesus, yeah. Mm. Exactly. Do you think... Uh, 
Some of the social outcasts felt uncomfortable associating with a rabbi? He probably did with other rabbis, but not this one. It's, it's not uncommon for those of a lower order to, to feel uncomfortable associating with those of whom they might would consider a higher order. Mm -hmm. So initially, um, if they had no relationship to him to begin with, they might have, have uh, felt a certain shine. As well, what about the lady who, um, who touched his garment? Mm -hmm. right. You know, she followed along and, uh, you know, if I can just touch his garment, I, I think there may have been that kind of a, of a sense of um, yeah. cast. Children were drawn to him. It, it's <coughs> yeah. a good, good uh, indicator. Indicator, good gut estimators of what adults are like. Yeah. Well, let's come to our first story. That story is found in John 8. We're not going to take time to read the first 11 verses, but... Background, we have to look at a couple of verses from the Old Testament. Look at Leviticus 20, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with the wife of a fellow Israelite, both he and the woman shall be put to death. Okay? And uh, if we read on, we would discover that it's the husband who is supposed to bring an accusation against them. Okay? The hus husband of the wife who had committed adultery. Okay, look at Deuteronomy 20. Uh, verses 20, we're not going to read this whole thing. If a man is caught having intercourse with another man's wife, both of them are to be put to death. In this way, you'll get rid of this evil. And it goes down about what happens if, you know, if the woman is, if it actually happened out in the, out in the wild somewhere where the woman might have shouted for help, but nobody was there to hear her, then she was not to be considered guilty, only the man. But then, look at verse 28. Suppose a man is caught raping a young woman who is not engaged. He is to pay her father the bride price of 50 pieces of silver, and she is to become his wife because he forced her to have intercourse with him. He can never divorce her as long as he lives. Okay? Um, in light of those verses, how should Joseph have treated Mary? Hmm. Don't everybody <laughs> talk. <Yeah. laughs> Well, he did at the beginning want to dismiss her at least. But okay. Not, but not embarrass her. Yeah. yeah. He sought to he sought to um, do what he believed was the appropriate thing for him to do, but not um, place her in a circumstance where she would be publicly disgraced. Well, he, he's in a difficult position because <coughs> people would have known that he was interested in her. The whole town would have known that he was interested in her. And all of a sudden now she's pregnant. So according to the verse I just read, what would, what would the townsfolk say? You've got to marry this girl and you've got to stay with her for the rest of your life, right? Isn't that what's supposed to happen if, this is a, if she's a virgin? Well, that's if he did the deed. Uh, oh. You have to... I'm just, I'm just telling you what the people in the town thought. By the way, it was kind of tricky. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go to or Johnny. They may have thought <clears throat> that Joseph was doing the right thing yeah. by distancing himself from her and you know, going on with his own life because he wasn't the one that was responsible. Somebody else is responsible. And well, it's easy for you to believe that. What did they believe? Well, if, if, if you heard somebody here in Loma Linda... It's hard say what they believe because I wasn't there. <laughs> okay, but if you have, here in Loma Linda and you heard that some young woman had... Uh, well, let's say you work with young women, teenagers. Mary is almost certainly a teenager. And now all of a sudden she's pregnant and she says, well, actually, God appeared to me and I'm pregnant because God appeared to me. And you would say, sure, no problem. <laughs> right? <laughs> Another fifty-one, fifty on her. Yeah, <laughs> take her to a psychiatric hospital. Huh? Yeah. I mean, I mean, be honest. You know, those people aren't went dumb. Well, you know, there's a possibility that some other man could have got into yeah. this situation. Yeah, we don't really know what they were actually thinking. Yeah. Um, Wasn't this brought up somewhere in the? In the New Testament. They were yeah. they were constantly accusing Jesus of being illegitimate. That's right. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. Now let's go. What happened? We have the story here. Jesus is teaching early in the morning in the temple courtyard, 
And all of a sudden, here come these dignitaries with their big robes, their fancy gar turbans and everything, and here they have this woman. And they throw her down on the pavement and say, Teacher, we have caught this woman in the very act of committing adultery. And what happened? What did Jesus respond? He wrote in the sand. Okay. What, what was their purpose in bringing her? It was a trap. Yes. For what kind of a trap? If he said, oh, it's okay, then he's disregarding the law what, of What's okay? Uh, she can let her go. Okay. Then he would be regarded, he, he's ignoring the law of Moses. That's right. Because she was supposed to be stoned. Yeah. If he said she should be stoned, like the law mm -hmm. says, then that's disregarding the Roman authority, who were the only ones that could sentence someone to death. So they thought they had an airtight case. They were going to, no matter what Jesus said, they were going to trap him. Right? But what, doesn't it say that it's the man and the woman? Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't seem to mention to that. You know what Leviticus <laughs> did, but... Conveniently, they... Yeah. We, 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 that, that, that situation is often mentioned, that they're not really complying with, with mm -hmm. the law. They're, they're bringing this woman here because she's breached the law, but they're not fulfilling completely, uh, yeah, abiding by the law themselves. But... An alternative might be that the man was not really uh, guilty and, and that it could have been a sting. They may have set this all up. They may have gotten somebody. They did. To, they may have gotten somebody to, to uh, have her come in and um, before it got heavily involved. You know, it's the intent. Mm -hmm. And so there may not have been, he may not have been involved other than he, but you know, um, there's no there's no law in Leviticus for sting operations. Well, that's true. I'm just trying to <laughs> just trying to say, you know, that there may be some other alternatives, some okay. some arguments in rebuttal to that. I'm not sure I believe it, but okay. So what if what if Jesus went after the guy? He says, "Well, where's the guy?" You know, uh, that would have good most likely. Been a good, it would have been a good start, but I think he had a better idea. He's going to tell everybody what everybody else does. Yeah. So I, I, I'm almost certain if he had said, oh, so where's the man? They would have said, he ran away before we could catch him. Hmm. Yeah. Well, who are the witnesses? Yeah, okay. Because, because it also says in Leviticus that the eyewitnesses are supposed to throw the first stones. That's what it says in Leviticus. Hmm. So, we know that back in the days of Moses, Jesus wrote some things on some tables of stone, didn't he? He wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger on stone. What do you suppose would happen if he had written... He, you know, we, we know he, he bent over and he started writing in the sand, and, and there's very good evidence to suggest that he was writing the sins of the people who had brought the lady. Now, I don't know exactly what he wrote on there, but they knew immediately that he was talking about them because they left, who left first? The oldest, and then the next one, and then the next one. So it was very specific what he wrote in the dust. What do you suppose if, if all those sins had been written out in the stones of the temple, wouldn't that be the biggest tourist attraction in Jerusalem mm -hmm. today? If it well, survived. there's there's some symbolic symbolism there because mm -hmm. When he wrote on the stone, that he's writing about God's character. When he wrote on the sand, well, then you could be forgiven. Yeah. So. A few footprints, a few puffs of wind, and the record would be gone. So Jesus was incredibly kind to these scoundrels, mm -hmm. right? Not, kind, not just kind to the woman. He's incredibly kind to the scoundrels. Well, in John 8, 8, we notice that the men left, slinking away, beginning with the eldest. And I would suggest if you have access to those two books, Desire of Ages, look at pages 460 to 462. If you have the book Ministry of Healing, look at pages 86 to 89. And Ellen White says these words, This was to her, that is this woman, when Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. This was to her the beginning of a new life, a life of purity and peace, devoted to God, uh, devoted to God. In the uplifting of this fallen soul, Jesus performed a greater miracle than in healing the most grievous physical disease. 
He cured the spiritual malady which is unto death everlasting. This penitent woman became one of his most steadfast followers. Based on that statement and others, other evidence that's in Scripture, um, a lot of people believe that this may have been Mary Magdalene. With self-sacrificing love and devotion, she showed her gratitude for his forgiving mercy. For this erring woman, the world had only contempt and scorn, but the sinless one pitied her weakness and reached to her a helping hand. While the hypocritical Pharisees denounced, Jesus bade her go and sin no more. So, uh, the next story is found in Mark 5, but we need a little bit of background. This is a very interesting story. Jesus had spent a whole day, a long day, preaching to the people along the seashore near Capernaum. You read about that in Mark 4 and, Mark, and Matthew 13. After that long day, and he was really tired, when he got into the boat, he told them, get in, we're going to get in the boat, and I want you to cross the Galilee. And this is evening. Um, he fell asleep at the back of the boat. Now, this isn't a huge boat, but he's sleeping in the back there. There were other boats available, and people crowded into them to follow Jesus and his disciples. When they got out on the lake, a terrible storm arose. By the way, how do you suppose all of a sudden there was this terrible storm? Any idea? Good time for the devil to try and drown him. Absolutely. I mean, here's all the disciples and Jesus in one boat, and the devil thinks, this is my chance. Drown these people if I possibly can. And what happened? He spoke to the well, storm. Well, it was so bad, they were sure. Oh, they were afraid, The yeah. fishermen were sure they were going to die. Right. And finally, as the boat was about to sink, they thought, how did we get ourselves in this mess? It was Jesus who told us to come out here. Where is he? There he is sleeping. I mean, it's a little hard to imagine how he could sleep in a relatively small boat that's being tossed by waves and the water's pouring in, etc. But he was sleeping. And they woke him up, and what did he do? He stood up, and there were, the other boats were close enough around so they could see what was happening. He just said, where's your faith? Peace be still. The sea is like glass. That's something a, a, no miraculous thing, or a miracle worker can duplicate. And he did that in Genesis 1. Yeah. He spoke, and the waters divided. I mean, to, to have control of water is pretty powerful. Well, he also had control of all the fish in the water. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Were you going to comment? Anyway. So, they found him sleeping and so forth. Um, and that's all spelled out in Matthew, by Mark 4, 35 to 41, and Matthew and Luke and other, in the related passages. So, early the next morning, they arrived on the opposite shore. So, where are they on the opposite shore? What's on the opposite shore, first of all? Gentile territory. This is Gentile territory. And presumably the disciples hadn't been there really often with their ships, hadn't gone all the way over and actually landed, because they ended up landing, apparently, on the edge of a cemetery. What, what was the purpose for, for Jesus telling them to go over there? Well, that's was what it, you're was supposed it, to answer when I get done with this story. Was it, I mean, what, well, was it, did he go over there for, for about what's to happen, or was, was it part of a trip that he was what he was taking. He, he is because of what's about to happen. Yeah. He got some rest on the way. So, yeah, well, a little bit anyway. So, when they landed on the shore, he was attacked by two demon-possessed men. Now, Matthew says two, Mark and Luke say one. They probably were two. One was probably more prominent than the other. As the disciples ran, Jesus stood his ground in a personal power struggle. I can see him standing with his hand up with the devil himself. Now, Jesus had battled with the devil previously, hadn't he? Mm -hmm. In the wilderness of temptation, right? And he was not backing down, not one inch. You know, no, it's hmm? interesting here that <coughs> not very long before, Jesus just had controlled the forces of nature. Mm -hmm. And the disciples had seen this. Now they get off the boat and these two crazy guys come. They're running. At, yeah, and they're running. They, they just... If they don't seem to realize that if he can control the forces of nature, he ought to be able to handle this, but they ran. No doubt the devil was furious that he hadn't been able to drown them the night before. We may not clearly understand deep in possession. Ellen White says these words, Evil spirits in the beginning created sinless, 
were equal in nature, power, and glory with the holy beings that are now God's messengers. But fallen through sin, they are leagued together for the dishonor of God and the destruction of men. United with Satan in his rebellion and with him cast out from heaven, they have, through all succeeding ages, cooperated with him in his warfare against the divine authority. So who are these evil spirits? Fallen angels. Fallen angels. Um, we are told in Scripture of their confederacy and government, of their various orders, of their intelligence and subtlety, and of their malicious designs against the peace and happiness of men. Great Controversy, page 513, paragraph 2. So what does Jesus do next? He casts out the thousands of demons. Remember the man said, he said, what is your name? Our name is Legion because there's so many of us. He cast the thousands of demons from men into the 2,000 pigs which ran down the cliff and drowned in the Sea of Galilee. I wonder if the Jews found out about this, if they were willing to eat any fish or drink any water from the Sea of Galilee for how long in the future? <laughs> A short time later, the populace came out and asked Jesus to leave fearing further financial loss. But, and here's the clue, also just a couple pages later in Great Controversy, page 515. But the, so it seemed like it was a wasted trip. They, 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 you know, they took their riot lives in their hands with a storm on the sea. They get over there. They've only been there a very short time. This couple things happen, and now they're leaving again. But the purposes of Christ were not thwarted. He allowed the evil spirits to destroy the herd of swine um, as a rebuke to those Jews who are raising these unclean beasts for the sake of gain. So who's raising these pigs? Jews. Jews. Are they supposed to be dealing with pigs? Not at all. But there were a fair number of Jews living there among the pagans. Well, maybe they just hired these other people to do the <laughs> well, dirty maybe. work and they took, sure. care of the, took care of the money. Yeah, of course. But is that what you're supposed to be doing if you're a Jew? Had not Christ restrained, listen to this, had not Christ restrained the demons, they would have plunged into the sea not only the swine, but also their keepers and owners. Hmm. Had not Christ restrained the devil, he would have drowned the whole lot of them. The preservation of both the keepers and the owners was due alone to his power, mercifully exercised for their deliverance. Now, that ought to make you think of one, one or two things. They didn't thank him, though, did they? Not immediately. So Jesus told the two demon-possessed men to do what? what? Well, first of all, what did the demon-possessed men want to do? They wanted to stay with him and his group. They said, let us go. Let us go with you. Now, the next question I would ask you is, okay, so Jesus, suppose Jesus said, yeah, come on, jump in the boat. They get back on the other side. What are these two formerly demon-possessed Gentiles going to be doing over there in Galilee? Uh, do we know they were Gentiles for sure? There were a few Jews in this territory. Yeah. We don't know for sure, but likely. Okay. Well, but Gentiles were welcome to come along with Jesus. In yeah, I'm group, sure the, weren't they? the Pharisees would have run down to the shore and give them a big hug, right? <laughs> well, but <laughs> well, we're talking about outcasts here and how Jesus received people. He wouldn't. Yeah. <clears throat> he wouldn't. He wouldn't turn them away yeah. for. But at the same time, it very clearly would have diminished his his ministry if he was hanging around with some Gentiles. Then a lot of Jews wouldn't have had anything to do with him. It was bad enough he had he had tax collectors and other sinners hanging around. But it, but it also states there too that the, there were those amongst the group that saw the difference between these men now that they've got their mind back. Absolutely. And Christ, in effect, used them to go spread amongst the people up there. Well, we need to absolutely, it's essential that we see the rest of the story. What happened? Sometime later, a few months later, Jesus returned to Decapolis, and what did he find? Thousands who had heard the formerly demon-possessed men's stories came out to see Jesus. Now, this is Gentile territory now. Came out to see Jesus and stayed with him for three days, after which he, had, he fed them all. The 4,000 men plus women and children. Mark 10, Mark 8, 1 to 10, Matthew 15, 32 and 33, and Desire of Ages, page 404. What so, do you think, what do you think he, they, he taught them in those three days? A lot of things. 
So, now let's stop and think about this for a moment. Jesus has just sent two formerly demon-possessed men as the first Gentile missionaries. Right? Yeah. The first missionaries to the Gentiles. And the missionaries to the Gentiles, yeah. Yeah. And how much did they know about Christ? Yeah. To be so once again, off as missionaries. Yeah. Once again, Satan is defeated. Hundreds were healed, and no doubt thousands were convinced that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. And we know from early church history that when Jerusalem was destroyed, the headquarters, more or less, of the Christian church moved into this territory, this area. Antioch? Well, eventually it got to Antioch, but temporarily it was in Perea. It was just, they just moved across the Jordan River. They stayed there from, remember the first attack on Jerusalem was in AD 66, and it wasn't finally destroyed until AD 70. During that period of time, the disciples that were still left, however they, how many they were in the, in the Christian church basically had its headquarters, over there in Decapolis and Perea. Okay, next story. John 4. This is the story, you remember, of the Jesus coming to the well at Sychar. What do we know about Sychar? What do we know about the area? We don't have time to look at it right now, but if you, if you took a map and you drew a line straight from Jerusalem to Nazareth, or even into the central part of Galilee, it would go right through Sychar. There's a path through the mountains there, and, and Sychar is in the bottom of one of those valleys that would take you, if you were going there, the most direct path, you would go by Sychar. That's Samaritan territory, though. Samaritan territory. What was wrong with that? They, they were unclean. They didn't mix with them. Okay. There's a number of reasons why they didn't mix with them. First of all, the Samaritans were originally people left over from the ten tribes which had been taken into Assyrian or, or Nineveh, conquered by the Ninevites, Assyrians. Um, and then they had mixed up people from other pagan areas, and so they, their, their religion was corrupt. But then, finally, the Samaritans had made their own temple, a Gerizim, and were trying to worship God more or less like the Jews did, and John Hyrcanus, I think it was, one of the early Jewish leaders, well, just a few hundred years or so before Jesus, took a big group of Jews up there and destroyed their temple. So that did not uh, make them any happier about their relationship to the Jews at all. So, it's interesting to notice that in John 3, Jesus speaks to one of the Jewish elite. We'll get to that story in future lessons. In the middle of the night, because, it, I mean, not in the middle of the night, but at least at secret, in secret at night. And in John 4, he speaks to a Samaritan woman in the open, in the middle of the day. An interesting contrast. So, what kind of customs did Jesus, Jesus break as he was speaking to this woman? No. Well, but he even spoke he was, to her. Yeah, just speaking to her. Okay, as a Jew, he was not supposed to have anything to do with Samaritans, period. What else? As an unrelated male, he was not to have any contact with a female. Okay, and certainly not a Samaritan female. Anything else you can think of? Even if he did have contact with her, as a Jew, he was not allowed to drink from the same cups, from use the same pitchers, the same pots, nothing. She wasn't even touch, supposed to touch he was what he should have done according to Jewish custom. If she came to draw water and he had no pitcher, he was supposed to move about twenty feet away, at least twenty feet away, not say a word, wait till she finished her business, leave, and then he could come back and sit at the well again. That's what was supposed to happen. What did happen? He asked for water. Struck up a conversation. He just sat there, struck up a conversation, asked for a drink of water. And we don't have time to go through the whole conversation, but in that process, he revealed to her that he was what? First of all, that he was a prophet, because he knew about her background. Marital, or lack of marital background. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you call that. Her marital history. Mm -hmm. If you're having been married to five other men, and now she's working on number six, I guess. 
And so what else happened? The woman tried to change the conversation and said, well, we Samaritans worship God here on this mountain and you Jews worship over there in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, no, we're, we're not going to go there. She says, well, we know that the Messiah is coming. And what did Jesus say? <clears throat> I am he. I am he. Now, in the Old Testament, God's name was I am. Mm -hmm. But this isn't the same I am, is it? It's almost. Almost. Or as she says, I who spoke, uh, speak to you am he. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would she have recognized uh, that, that intimation there? Yeah, she did. Well, I'm... What, what, I would. I, I understand. I know that she understood him to say, "I'm the Messiah," mm -hmm. but would she have understood that that intimation of the "I oh, am"? Oh, 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 the "I am." I'm not sure about that. <coughs> That's. Good. I'm not sure. But what did she do? Ran to tell her family what she. She ran to town to tell the men. Interesting. It says, "What did she tell the men? Come and see say, someone." This is the Messiah. She said. Could this be the Messiah? Come and see someone who told me everything I ever did. And people in town said, well, that would be an interesting story to hear, right? <laughs> Could this be the Messiah? And, and what was the question instead of making a statement? Yeah, kind of like Jesus had done, didn't it? You know, weren't, the, weren't the disciples in, in town? Mm -hmm. They're in town trying to buy some food, so, following careful customs. So... When she created this ruckus in there, were they, you think they were aware of that? Good question. We don't know. I wondered that myself. Yeah. Well, the disciples come back, and what does Jesus say? By the way, what did the woman do with her pot? She left it there. So, do you think the disciples and Jesus got water? By the way, I've had the privilege of visiting that spot. It's hard to get there now because it's in the Palestinian territories and you can't go there easily. Uh, but it's possible. Back in the days, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when I first went there, you could drive right up there. I got pictures of it. It's probably hard to carry one of those pots on your head when you're running. Yes, probably when you're running. Yes, it is. Yeah, exactly. Anyway... She left her pot, ran to town, told all those things. And Jesus said, I have more than, I have food that you don't know anything about. What was he talking about? The words he could tell them. Mm -hmm. The stories he could give them. He was so excited about the possibility that he was going to be able to evangelize a whole village of Samaria that he didn't want to stop right then and worry about eating or drinking. And is that our attitude? Well, he must have made his mark because they asked him to stay on. And he, and they he did. did. He stayed two days yes, and yes. in that two days taught them everything they needed to know? Yeah. Apparently. So he was so excited? So yeah. is it kind of an emotional thing that it takes the place of this food? Is that oh, what you're saying? Whatever, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. well, they got a good reception. I mean, mm -hmm. they could have probably thrown him out, too, if they'd have wanted to. Don't they just listened, or do you think they had questions? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure they did. How are we supposed to treat those Jews over there? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> probably some of that, too. <laughs> okay, well, we're, we're running out of time. I want, we want to talk at least one more story. Look at Matthew 9. Verses 9 to 13. Jesus left that place, and as he walked along, he saw a tax collector named Matthew sitting in his office. He said to him, follow me. Now, where, what city, what town is Jesus in? Capernaum, wasn't it? Capernaum. Matthew was a tax collector in Capernaum. And who lived in Capernaum? Peter. Peter and Andrew, James and John. That's where they did their fishing. We don't, we don't know absolutely for sure that they lived here, but that's where they worked. So this would be their local tax collector. Their IRS agent. Their IRS, IRS agent. Every day, yeah. yeah. Corrupt IRS agent. Careful. <laughs> Why do you suppose Matthew just got up, he left everything? It says he left everything and followed Jesus. 
Why? That's a hard question to answer. Well, it seemed like all those guys did that. We're told that they recognized, not them specifically, but Christ had already been noted that he spoke with authority. And, and I think that was probably what caught their attention. And I, the road, go ahead. I think like some of the other disciples that he called, he'd had contact with these yeah. people before. Yeah. And Matthew had probably heard him and oh, said, yes. yeah. this guy has something. Yeah. This was not the first time he had ever heard of Jesus. He knew a lot about Jesus. He sat there and he was thinking hard about this Jesus. And when Jesus came along and said, follow me, he said, I'm there. I'm right with you. So what did Matthew do? He called a big feast. He put together a big feast. And he welcomed all the elites in town, right? All the tax collectors. Tax collectors and prostitutes. And other low life, as we would, some people would say today, right? All of his friends and neighbors. <laughs> friends and, neighbors. <laughs> and of course, immediately some people are complaining, right? All the high level people, especially the Pharisees, he says, why does your, it said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with such people? And Jesus heard them and answered, people who are well do not need a doctor, but only those who are sick. Go and find out what is meant by the scripture that says, it is kindness that I want, not animal sacrifices. I have not come to call respectable people, but outcasts. And that, of course, comes from the book of Hosea. So, Matthew was delighted to follow Jesus. He, he left everything. He prepared this feast. Jesus responded to what we just read. Let me read these words from Ellen White. The Pharisees beheld Christ sitting and eating with publicans and sinners. He was calm and self-possessed, kind, courteous, and friendly. And while they could not but admire the picture presented, it was so unlike their own course of action, they could not endure the sight. The haughty Pharisees exalted themselves and disparaged those who had not been blessed with such privileges and light as they themselves had had. They hated and despised the publicans and sinners. Yet in the sight of God, their guilt was the greater. Heaven's light was flashing across their pathway, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. But they had spurned the gift. Turning to the disciples of Christ, they said, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? By this question, they hoped to arouse the prejudice which they knew had existed in the minds of the disciples and thus shake their weak faith. They aimed their arrows where they would be most likely to bruise and wound. Volume 5 of the SDA Bible Commentary, page 1088, paragraph 3. So, so that's, that makes it sound like the disciples were pretty close to not believing Jesus. At one point, anyway. So how did Jesus feel about association with sinners and outcasts? It was the outcast, the publican and sinner, the despised of the nations that Christ called and by his loving kindness compelled to come unto him. The one class that he would never countenance was those who stood apart from in their self-esteem and look down upon others. Ministry of Healing 164, paragraph 2. The fallen must be led to feel that it is not too late for them to be men, or women, we might add. Christ honored man with his confidence and thus placed him on his honor. Even those who had fallen the lowest, he treated with respect. It was a continual pain to Christ to be brought into contact with enmity, depravity, and impurity. But never did he utter one expression to show that his sensibilities were shocked or his refined tastes offended. Whatever the evil habits, the strong prejudices, or the overbearing passions of human beings, he met them all with pitying tenderness. As we partake of his spirit, we, should re we shall regard all men as brethren, with similar temptations and trials, often failing or falling and struggling to rise again, battling with discouragements and difficulties, craving sympathy and help, then we shall meet them in such a way as not to discourage or repel them, but to awaken hope in their hearts. 
How well are we at doing? How well are we doing as Seventh Day Adventists reaching out to these people? Do we feel so uncomfortable that we can't minister to them? How do we relate to the homeless, to drug addicts, high school dropouts, prostitutes, mentally disturbed people, illegal immigrants, beggars? What about pregnant teens? What is our natural response when we come in contact with these people? Do we immediately put up barriers? Would we dare to hug them? Try to imagine yourself as one of these people. Where would you live? How would you get money to survive? Would you trust anyone? How do you think you would be treated by other people? Would you feel comfortable going to your, to your church? How would you try to get out of your problems and find a better way of life? Try to put yourself in each of these Bible stories. I, that's one of the things I do when I study these stories. I try to imagine, okay, where would I be? in the story of the woman at Sychar? Where would I be in the story of the woman taken in adultery? Where would I be in the story of Matthew's feast? Where would I be when God calls me to go and work in his vineyard? Would I say yes and not go? Or would I say no and go? Which one of those two sides do each one of us more easily relate to? Do you think Jesus made intentional efforts to break down social barriers in his day? Intentionally. Do we do that? I think everything he did was intentional. Okay. So if we are to follow Jesus, should we be breaking down barriers? How do we do that? Are we welcoming the outcasts? the drunkards, the pregnant teens to our churches, prostitutes, drug dealers. I mean, it's pretty tough, you know. We don't, we're not too comfortable around those people. I don't know any people like that. I see, okay. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> if we're to follow Jesus, we should be looking out for these people, and we should be inviting them to associate with us. You think we could do that? See you next week.